Randall. Welcome to the latest episode of Tech Sales Class with me, James Hounslow. Uh, and today, uh, I'm delighted we've got Ian Amit on the show. Ian, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good, James. Uh, lovely to be here. Thanks for for having me. No problem. But Ian, um, I wanted to have you on the on the show for uh, a couple of uh, reasons. The amount of knowledge and insight that you can have to share with a lot of our um founders uh within our network um and that's because you're uh, probably a a CISO at heart and uh, and currently a founder solving problems and um just looking through what you uh, you get up to you like to help people solving problems so at the moment um you're a founder yourself you are building a um a business um but you're also uh, at the same time as occupying all your hours of the day in your startup you right. also appear to be helping three or four other startups um, <laughs> and and advising those, which I think is is magnificent. Um, I would love to know how you find the time uh, in the day, um, but we will definitely get into that. Um, but as a way of getting started, um, Ian, if you could just give the viewers just a, a little snapshot into uh, who you are, what you've been doing up until where you are today. Yeah, of course. Yeah, sounds good. So you said a CISO at heart. I... I actually categorize it as a security practitioner at heart, or, or basically a hacker. Yeah, and that's been you know kind of representing my entire career. Feeling very fortunate to be able to do it and actually get paid to do it. Uh, to me, it's it's an opportunity to deal with the things that I'm really passionate about, which is technology, which is computer science, which is the human side of things, and and kind of hacking that combination. I spent most of my career in in cybersecurity uh, from from started at pen testing, mm -hmm. looking at application security, operating system security, network security, uh, kind of traversing that that spectrum, expanding into red teaming, uh, again bringing in more of the social and physical elements of security, recognizing that security is not just about technology. It's about how it's being incorporated into a you know working organism like a business. And uh, at the end of it, yes, maturing into that CISO position where it, it really culminates all of those elements together and being responsible uh, on behalf of the business, on behalf of the stakeholders for assuring that the business can operate securely and safely over time. And, and yeah, as you've mentioned, I've, I've crossed the lines. Uh, not twice. This is not, not once. This is my second time as a, as a founder of, of a cybersecurity startup. So you can call it, you know, addiction. You can call it a, a slow learning curve, whatever you want to, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Uh, but yes, I've, I've recently crossed the lines after four years of service as, as a chief security officer and started my own company, uh, which is Gombok AI. Uh, so yes, going back to kind of entrepreneurial and uh, and as much as I, you've mentioned the different startups that I work with, uh, I really enjoyed and still enjoy working with those startups and founders, especially when I was a CTO, because I was able to help them and, and, and influence them and help them improve on their, you know, product positioning, go to market, kind of just ideation, whatever, whatever is required from a startup. Thoroughly enjoy it because I'm probably an entrepreneur, entrepreneur by heart yeah. as well. And especially as, you know, if, if you have a major day job like a CISO, Having that opportunity to work with different startups as as a as a board advisor is a phenomenal opportunity to get your hands dirty without, you know, the fear of, of failure. You know, that that's what kind of brought me to to that position of being able to work with those different startups. Yeah. So um, there's so much to to dive into um, about yourself. You've you've covered so much. Even like we should we should let the viewers know that you reside in um, in New York. Um, so, um, uh, and we'll, and we'll get into that, that detail, but, um, you know, you talk about, you know, the, um, the experience you get from talking to those, um, startups and advising, but the fact remains is that your pathway through to where you are today comes from being in that CISO world, which gives you mm -hmm. what I believe an upper hand on what a lot of founders are doing now, where they're coming out and they're selling a cyber product, having never, been in the like kind of on the industry side and i'd like to sort of like touch on on that first and the 
the what was it like as a um, as a CISO? Because also, I, I I like to point out that the business that you you're doing now is solving a pro you saw a problem that wasn't being fixed by technology, and you've right. gone away to to solve that. So so there is there is so much cybersecurity, and I reckon that most CISOs spend eighty percent of their time answering technology calls with people trying to sell them something or other give us a, just a, a snapshot into what it's like as a as a CISO and I would also like to know what was it like in Israel against what it was like in America all right definitely a lot to unpack here I'll, I'll start with with the the 80 percent statement yes it, it does seem like a CISO is inundated constantly with new technologies startups solutions products, whatever it is mm. that they have to kind of respond to, especially if you look at, at the typical CISO's inbox or, or text messages or, or even phone, phone logs, that's, that's just horrible to me. But uh, fortunately, I would say that, that if you're a good CISO, you're not spending 80% of your time responding <laughs> to those things. You're probably spending 80% of your time figuring out where are you in your security journey as, as a company? Where are you in terms of your maturity and the areas that you want to improve on and, and the risk levels and the, and the risk acceptance and how that aligns with the available technologies and solutions and then be able to kind of narrow down the question of offerings and, and questions and, and attempts to, to get into your, your budget to what really matters. Yeah. So that's, that's to begin with. Um, Typical day in the life of a CISO, I don't know if there's a typical day. <laughs> you're always expecting to be surprised, I guess. You're always expecting kind of for the breach and, and to spring into action. And if it doesn't happen, it's it's mostly about risk management, I would say. That's first and foremost. Then it's uh, it's what it's really about. And I'm, I'm leaving the technology aside because I think that's a byproduct. It's uh, it's it's. It's all about relationship management. Uh, we, are, we all have to remember that the CISO's job, or, or at least a good CISO's job, never relies on, on the CISO's ability to, to enforce things. It, it's mostly about influencing. It's mostly about understanding what the business does, what matters to the business, what's driving you know, the, the revenue, uh, where are the risky areas, not just from a security perspective, but from a business perspective, and then being the the custodian of being able to translate that into, all right, so how do we deal with that on the technology level, on the process level, on the human level, on the financial level even, and, and you know, be able to identify those different stakeholders in the business, create good relationships with them, be able to communicate about it. So it's, it's really about being able to influence rather than kind of yield the hammer of that shell and, and kind of smack down on, on capabilities. So that's the second kind of order of, of tasking or, or efforts that a CISO has in terms of kind of grooming and, and working with the business and those relationships. And only then comes the, I would say, daily part of, of the more technological areas of making sure that whatever we have is still operational kind of you know, looking at the metrics and, and the you know, the data points to make sure that, you know, nothing's out of place, our coverage is good, our, our you know, protections are are still deployed correctly. And again, it goes back to being ready for, for an incident, being ready to be surprised. What haven't I thought about from a risk perspective to a threat perspective that might, you know, you don't want to be surprised. That's yeah. that's the bottom line. Like it. Um so taking back to 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 when you would when you were in Israel, what made you take that big risk uh, and leave Israel and uh, and head to the U.S.? So again, this is this is not my first time uh, doing that switch between Tel Aviv and New York. Uh, I've, I've lived here in New York for for eleven years in aggregate, five years and then five years back and five years again and then five years back in Tel Aviv and now finally back here. To me, New York is is really the kind of you know I don't know. I am a little biased. I've again <laughs> been New York City resident for eleven years. And it's the greatest city in the world, if you ask me. Yeah, it's it's where the you know it's where business is being done. It, Tel Aviv, as fun as it is, and and security oriented, you know, capital of cyber and startups and stuff like that. I think it's still 
um, dealing with with you know a very small economy, mm. uh, not a lot of uh, you know major companies CISOs there. So if, if you're looking at the local market, there's not a lot of experience in in the global markets and how big big companies operate. I love the challenge. I love kind of stepping up and, and increasing the, the level of difficulty, which is probably what what brought me to working in New York and and dealing with with more global companies and uh, at the bigger yeah, bigger scope, I would say, and bigger uh, challenges. Tel Aviv again, it's it's a it's a very tight knit community, lots of innovation, uh, but that lack of Global exposure, that lack of skill, I think, is what uh, is what drives me time time and again to get back to New York, where where things really happen. I'm closer to my customers here. I'm closer to the industry in general. And at the end of the day, if I'm looking at it from from a founder's perspective as well, everyone's talking about uh, availability of talent and oh, you know, Israel with the cyber talent and this and that. And I, I kind of tell people, and, and people sometimes ask me, like, how do you find people, you know, to work for you? And in New York City, it's, it's very expensive. I was like, well, first of all, the cost of living in New York City and cost of living in Tel Aviv is pretty much the same. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately. Second of all, draw a circle uh, with a, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 mile radius around New York City. How many people are there? Oh. And, you know, yeah. 30, 40 million, you know, yeah. that's way more than, than the yeah. entire state of Israel combined. So there's no sort of shortage of talent. Of talent. Um, so that kind of solve, solves for, for both the scale as well as the talent accessibility uh, and being able to run a company here. Again, be with my customers, be part of the industry, not having to travel back and forth. Because if you look at, at a typical founder in in, the, in a cyber startup in Tel Aviv, after a few months, mostly a year, they end up traveling to the US quite a bit. And uh, at the end of the day, they're expected, I'm doing air quotes here, to, to relocate because that's where the business is at, that's where they need to be. And whatever kind of initial partners or design partners they had in Israel, they outgrew them and they're, you know, if, if you try to work with the local economy, the local companies in Israel, they might have the tech advantage and be very advanced in that, but they don't have the scale. They don't have the, the, the kind of culture and exposure that a typical US or European company would have. And jumping, making that jump from working in that small tight knit economy to a global economy like the US or Europe is a challenge a lot of yeah. times for those security startups. Okay. So what what was the your main reason? So was it um, uh, a new job? What was the first reason, your your first adventure over to, to, to New York? What was the role that you were doing when you arrived in New York? And the first one was, yes, it, just, it was a job. It, yeah. it was the, the opportunity to, to dive into, a again, a bigger company, more exposure, more impact mm -hmm. than than I've ever had before, which is funny because it was in an Israeli company that had an R D R and D center in New York, yeah. and the headquarters in in New York. Yeah, so I've I've kind of had a taste of both sides, and once that switch was made over, I realized well we can do we can do the tech thing here as well, and we started kind of growing a a, a tech foundation in 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 the U.S. in New York and be close to our customers and be able to work closely with them and respond to them and, and be better at product market fit and sales. Yeah. And I've worked a lot with, you know, kind of sales support as a, as a chief architect and as a technologist to make sure that whatever it is that we're, you know, that a customer needs, we can translate that into features and being able to, to have a tighter loop around that was, was really critical uh, without the time zone difference, without even the cultural difference. Yeah. So, so you mentioned the cultural difference. I'd love to, to touch on that now. When um, you first went to uh, to New York and you're you're working there, was that when you went to work? Was that the first time you'd been to New York? Had you visited on holiday before? Uh, I've I've visited before. I visited before as a you know as a tourist. Yeah. And it's fun because the first time I moved to the U.S., I was actually 
intending to continue my studies. It was uh, pretty much fresh out of out of university, where I was already working part time, and I switched to full time. And I loved, you know, I graduated as a, as a computer science and, and business administration major, and I loved computer science. I loved the the kind of you know the the mental intellectual element challenge of it. And I fully intended to get my, my graduate, uh, in, you know, my master's and, and PhD in computer science. I applied to several universities, got accepted and said, you know what, let's work for a year. Let's get that industry experience like hands on for real in the US where, where, where everything's happening. So I'm not just another, you know, kind of academic that goes through degree by degree by degree without actual real, real world experience. And that was cute, and you know, I stepped into the industry full time and never looked back. Honestly, I'm still looking at oh, maybe I'll, I should get that that master's, maybe an MBA, maybe some more computer science. But uh, as a practitioner, as as you know, and you asked me before, and I said I, I consider myself a practitioner of of that field. Uh, I feel like yes, I could do, I could go back to the uh, academia and kind of solidify or, or get that additional degree, uh, but I'm having so much fun by being able to uh, to keep learning and, and kind of traverse different topics within cybersecurity, you know, for good or for worse, this this is this is what it is, it's part yeah. of it. If you're not constantly learning and understanding that if you feel like you know a topic very well, you're probably missing out on something. <laughs> so it might be super frustrating to to realize that, but for me, that's 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 exciting because there's always something new to learn. I like yeah, it because it's such a fairly new new kind of science. Yeah, for sure. So, um, what was the, so when you arrived in in, in New York to um, to live um, from a cultural standpoint? You mentioned that from a cultural standpoint, what was the biggest challenges that you that you faced i don't think i had too many cultural challenges moving here i mean at, at heart i guess i was always a, a, a kind of a, a the odd one out in in uh, in israel you know i've worked with us companies and, and global companies since day zero and my mentality has always been a little a little more american than israeli to be honest, so I, I really found at home in New York, and uh, and New York really it, it's a love hate relationship. You either love it and passionate about it, or it grinds you down to a point where like I can't stand it. I need to be out there, and honestly, it was just a, a culture fit for me, and and mostly a mental fit, I guess. Yeah, I love the the energy, the pace, the nonstop, the no bullshit, like very straight up. Uh, even in American terms, New York is a little odd yeah. one out. The, yeah. the 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 honesty, the you know, not not beating around the bush and trying to appease everyone. Uh, I love that. So there's a little bit, there's probably a little bit of a kind of an Israeli culture in New York, yeah. and, and a lot of American culture. So it was just a perfect fit for me culturally. I didn't see any any issues. And, and as I said before, you know, I worked most of my professional life in. In English, and, yeah. you know, conversing in English, thinking in English, documenting in English, so that it wasn't really a major change for for myself. So, um, I just want to touch on the um, the part there that you mentioned. There's a lot of um, talent in Israel, and also that a lot of Israeli tech founders find themselves traveling um, to and fro. There's a little bit of a new era where. Israeli founders are staying in Tel Aviv and they're hiring people in the US and not right. really coming. They're doing a bit of travel. Two parts of this. First one, if you were advising um, uh, an Israeli founder or, or any founder that's outside of, uh, mm -hmm. of the US that wanted to hire in New York, um, right. you've not been to, um, to New York, um, what would you what sort of like words of advice would you give them to help them understand how to identify the right person oh wow um i'll start with the bottom line i don't know it's <laughs> it's a really tough question and again yeah. I, I would i would say 
I've, I've been very fortunate because I've been working in the industry for over 25 years now. And I, and I have, you know, quite a bit of connections and I, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of salespeople, uh, which, you know, allowed me to get exposure to the good, to the bad, to kind of identifying the traits, mm -hmm. I would say, that work for me in terms of having a good relationship with a salesperson, with someone who's representing me. So I, I don't know how to replicate that systematically. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's probably more of your job. I mean, yeah. that's uh, that, that's where, where, you, where you typically fit in. And, and I would actually advise to look for a good matchmaker, to yeah. look for someone who can understand the found the specific founders mentality all right everyone is different everyone's got a different identity everyone's got a different yeah. different personal traits and and it's almost like therapy it's almost like psychologically you, know, you need to find the right match for that type of founder it's yeah. not you know i don't think that there's a character of a you know here's the best new york or east coast salesperson for you I don't think there is one. It's it, it's it's mostly going to be about you know being able to go back and forth between that founder and and that sales rep. We have to remember that, especially if the founder intends to stay more kind of Israeli uh, grounded. That person that they're hiring in the U.S. is their face, mm. is their representative in front of all their customers. So you know that that needs to carry all of that weight of of representing the company, the founder, the the, the ethos, the identity of who they are and what they do, and and to do that again, I, it's almost like couples therapy. <laughs> you need to find the right language. You need to find the right match. Yeah. So do you, do you think they say like, like firstly, would your first bit of advice be don't do that, move to the U.S. Um, and be part of it, know it, feel it, understand it, because you're right. There is no, and I and I and I talk to leaders all day long. There is no one one size fits all. You look at a character mm -hmm. of someone, and you try and find out what characters best suit your business to give someone the best chance of of success. Um, and I think you know you're right. There is a lot of uh, a, a true New Yorker is very similar to a true israeli in in terms right. of how they do it. but there are certain nuances which are different and one of those is effectively on how people hire in israel they've only hired israelis in israel i think right. a lot of weight goes on the reference from the military yeah you can't do that in the us um no <laughs> um so so um how do you how would you advise someone sort of like looks tackle to understand once they've got someone that you know they've they've used a good because they've got someone in front of them that they actually make sure that they understand what they're interviewing for um and how they get the answers that they are or that they're looking for? Yeah, that's a good question. I I'll go back to the first part and I, I definitely highly recommend, especially for people who do not have a lot of industry experience, you know, kind of fresh out of the, the, the military, even if they spent 10 years, 15 years in the military. I mean, all of that experience is great from a technological perspective, but most people that served in the army um, are lacking two things. One is real industry experience. Yeah. I mean, whatever it did in the military, however technology sophisticated it is with all the, the Sputniks and the, 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 the rockets and all that jazz, that's not how the industry works. And yeah. two, uh, what I'm seeing quite a bit is is more reliance on leadership by authority rather than leadership by identity or or you know, just just kind of soft skill leadership traits. So, first and foremost, I highly recommend for, for those people to do spend some time here on yeah. the ground to come with an open mind to come basically absorb as much as they can like a sponge about the culture about the dynamics about the language about you know what's what's allowed what's not allowed you know a little bit of abrasiveness is fine but you know th there's a very fine line once you cross it it's just awkward yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a lot of people fall into that trap of oh i'm i'm i'm, I'm tabar i'm israeli i'm like yeah. you know very direct and uh, there's only very little of that, that that you can push. So spend some time here. Definitely spend time with the candidates and yeah. and make it very clear what you're expecting. Yeah, and be honest about it. You're expecting them again, as I said before, 
to represent yourself, the company, what you're about, and and see how that resonates. See how they can translate that, and and ask them to pitch you, to pitch you back to you, and, and to pitch the company back to you. How you know to see how they represent the product, the service, whatever it is they stand for, and and try to figure out now as an, an audience whether that resonates, whether that makes sense. You know, if something was lost in translation, so. I think again, time on the ground here, uh, absorbing, understanding, and then being able to translate and 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 uh, kind of do a sanity check on on how is that salesperson, how is that representative translating that back to me is is really key for for a successful relationship. I like it. Um, let's try and. Um... Get into your into your uh, your thought process uh, now, Ian. And um, we touched on this when we uh, when we first spoke a couple of weeks ago. Because um, yeah. I always because I think um, I have so much appreciation for a fan. So I I, I work placing salespeople, um, sales pre sales, customer success. That's where 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 we work in, and it's great. But the respect I have for founders is is at another level because of the risk taking and everything that's in, involved with um, with doing it. Um, and a CISO is a pretty good job. It's exciting. There's always yes. something going on. Let's face it, they get paid yes. pretty well. What makes yep. someone step out of that into the completely uncomfortable, quite frankly, horrible world of a startup? <laughs> what, what makes you think, you know what, I'm going to give that a go? To be honest, yes, it's it's a very... Um, illogical decision. If, if yeah. you try to look at the the numbers and the metrics and the comfort level and the risk, um, it doesn't make sense. So I'll, I'll I'll start with that and admit, yes, you know, for, for most people, it's not a good fit. I would say it. it you know, you need to start with kind of a, 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 a an identity flaw, a <laughs> psychological trait that's like, yes, I can take the abuse. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it has to come from a from, from a point of passion. At least for me, I was very passionate about. And I'm, I'm the kind of person that doesn't complain about something unless they have a suggestion on how to fix it. Like I'm not going to complain about the weather. I'm not going to complain about the bus being late or something like that. Again, unless I've got a solution for it. And uh, and when I do, I'm very passionate about. It. Yeah. planning or, or solving that problem and that's what led me to do you know a lot of things in my career and that's what led me to you know be part of, of the b-sides oriented for mm -hmm. example that's what led me to to go on the speaker circuit and and, mm -hmm. and do research and apply myself to different different parts of the industry so again going back to that that crazy logical decision uh, yes, the CISO job is very cushy. You know, it's very challenging on one hand. I love it. I still love it. I think that that it encompasses so many different fields and gives you the opportunity to grow yeah. in so many different ways as an executive, as a person. And, and yes, it's it's very well compensated. Uh, but having said that, the impact that you have, uh, as big as it is, still is limited to to an organization, to a business. And what I faced last year when, when I left my last uh, CISO job was making that decision. Do I want to take another one of those? Uh, again, executive, highly compensated, highly influential within one company, or uh, try to kind of you know sit back a little bit, reflect on the past four years as, as a CISO, and try to figure out where we're the areas of friction that I was frustrated with that I didn't complain about because I didn't have a solution, but definitely needed one. And, and it took me a couple of months to, to do that kind of soul searching and, and reflection. And it was very, I mean, it was staring at my face, obviously, but it, it took me again, some time to, to solidify that, to distill that into what we're doing now with Gongwa. And, and once I had it, once I, I managed to, raise it in a very succinct way of like, this is that area. This is that that area of friction. I haven't seen a solution for it. Uh, I, I can see the ROI. I can see the amount of resources that are going into 
solving that area from a human perspective, throwing DevOps and developer and security resources at it, that I want to solve it. And I think that there is something to it. Uh, so once I got to that point, it was very clear to me that I'm going to use all that passion and kind of power of complaining and solving it to apply myself there. And, and that's what caused me to take that, that irrational step of saying, all right, I'm going to leave all of that, start a company, make, you know, take that risk. Uh, obviously, you know, as, as the founder, you have to, to always be able to think about the reward with all the risks, with all the, the, the challenges around it. You know, we're living in the future. Uh, I keep telling my, my co-founder and my, my employees, you know, you guys are operating like in the present. I'm, I, I'm barely here in the present. Yeah. I'm working six, 10, 12 months, two years ahead of you guys. I'm dealing with the problems of, of the future. And, and I'm kind of drawing back from that to, to what we're doing right now. Uh, so it, it really has to be a work of passion and, and you really have to kind of cling on to the opportunities that you are creating right now for yourself in your future. Interesting. So would you say by the sounds of things that you're more someone who wants to solve problems rather than someone who's saying, right, I want to create a business. I want to build a business. You're a problem solver and you're seeing challenges and you want to fix that. So you'll you'll go and do that. The way to do that is starting a a business um, and doing it. But that's that's your that's your idea. Would you say? I I would say yes. I would you know in my mind the path to having a successful business is rooted in solving a real problem. Yeah. And and going back to your your early statements about that transition from a CISO to a founder. I think that oh, that's kind of my superpower. Mm -hmm. Living through, you know, four years, five years, essentially 25 years of yeah. living through the industry and, and living through the problems and seeing them and experiencing them firsthand at the ground level it really allows me to, to identify that problem and, and solve it. And if, if I'm able to solve that as part of a business, that's going to make that business successful. It's not about jumping on the bandwagon and doing another one off. It's not about seeing other businesses succeed and saying, "Oh, I want to do that as well." So I can, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll copy that, change a few features, you know, add something, and have another product, another business, and kind of rinse, repeat a few times uh, to be kind of a, a, a serial founder. To me, it's more about. Again, yes, as, as you said, you know, stems from solving a problem. If that is the root of your business, I believe, again, I might be completely wrong, but I, I think that that's what, that's what gives a business, first of all, its, its core identity yeah. and, and mission. And if you have those, your chances of, of that business being successful are much higher. Love it. Um, so we, we've come up and you mentioned uh combo now so this is probably a really good time just to say right who are you guys what do you do what problem are you solving where are you at in your uh and your life you're still in, in in fairly embryonic stage but probably achieved a, a fair amount but uh this is if i if i i'll just uh, shut up for a moment and just allow you to tell us who you are yeah, sure. So, so at Gombok AI, what we're doing is we're solving cloud infrastructure security issues, and and the real focus. And I love the fact that you you kind of brought me in here from solving a problem, and the real emphasis in solving is 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 providing true remediations at the code level, tailored to each and every customer's environment for their cloud infrastructure issues. And, and that's what we do, that's what we do best. And the, the areas that, the, the friction areas that brought us to deal with this problem domain where essentially where security and DevOps meet. Mm -hmm. Security has a great visibility into all of the issues that, that exist in, in cloud infrastructure. However, they have zero authority to fix it they typically don't have the knowledge or experience to provide a practical advice on how to fix it. And they end up creating this arduous process of ticketing back and forth and kind of tag teaming with DevOps 
asking them to fix, you know, one, two, three issues out of a huge backlog of hundreds of issues. DevOps then has to do all the work of researching and understanding, all right, security is asking me to do something. Now I have to figure out how to do that in my specific environment because whatever security gave me, that template, best practice, blueprint, whatever it is, it's great, but it has zero applicability to my environment. Yeah. And there's a lot of, again, just by itself, tons of, of issues from knowledge gaps uh, through through process inefficiencies in that entire uh, realm. And that's what we're tackling. We're basically coming from the point of, first and foremost, recognizing that the customer environment is the blueprint, that that's our starting point. It's understanding what is the customer architecture and mm -hmm. what functionality it serves and and putting that as our prime objective like we're not going to break that first and foremost and then identify the security gaps that exist around that infrastructure and again i'm focusing just on the infrastructure lowest hanging fruit still one of the biggest problems that that companies face in terms of their their security maturity identifying the problems there and then delivering tailored remediations for that environment at the code level in a way that DevOps love and appreciate in a way that doesn't force DevOps out of their way to, to go into some security portal or dashboard and basically deliver those, you know, code reviews or, or, or pull requests straight back to their code and just fix things. So it's really focused on, on the solution part of it rather than pointing out the problem. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what we do. I love the fact that you, <laughs> you called it embryonic. Uh, yes, we, we did. We're, admittedly, we're fairly young. Uh, yeah. We were running funded only since November of uh, 22. However, uh, today is the 17th, which means that in nine days, we're having our MVP ready to go yeah, so as embryonic as we are we're, uh, we're i guess we're incubating yeah <laughs> really fast and uh i again i, I think it's it's uh it's a byproduct of having a very clear understanding of the problem and how do i want to solve it it's having a very clear understanding of what i do best and what i'm not going to do so anything outside of infrastructure i'm not dealing with i'm not dealing with application code i'm not dealing with runtime there's one thing that i do and i do best and i do it all the way you know to the left shifting left and, and that's what allowed us to to go from zero to to basically a minimal viable product in 6 months so so that was what i was going to touch with you to advisor a founders in place you've covered ground it takes many startups uh, a couple of years to to get to you spoke about like staying in your lane knowing what you're good at rather than trying to um uh, to fix all um but so if there was a, a advice that you could to give to share like the the success that you've had in getting yourself to where you are now what what would be a few words you'd say to a founder self-doubt Number one, uh, whatever decision or conclusion you get to, the second you get there, start challenging yourself. Uh, I do that all the time uh, for, for some of my peers and friends and partners. It's super frustrating because you get to the conclusion. It was like, all right, what have I gotten wrong? Challenge yeah. me. So I think it's a red team mentality that I've been carrying for most of my career of, of kind of, all right, what haven't I thought about? Like, what other conditions are there? Doing that over and over again and doing that as part of your product market fit process, doing that as part of your, um, you know, problem domain validation, talking to CISOs, talking to CISOs that I don't know personally. Yeah. Uh, you know, forcing myself not to, to seek advice from my friends in order to de-bias the friendly less factor. And getting feedback from people I don't know that are more willing to tell me that I'm wrong, I think that really strengthens the the ability to distill uh, the the problem into something that is viable, that uh, that resonates with you know a broader audience than just me and my my peer group, and and what allows us to build a product that hopefully is is very focused, as you said, 
you know, stay in your lane, understand that what you're doing or, or anticipate that, that what you're doing is going to yield such a high reward, such a high ROI for the customers that it's just going to be so super obvious for them that, oh, of course, yeah, I want to sell all of that arduous process. I want to eliminate it. I want to eliminate my, my backlog, get to like a backlog zero and stay there and just keep my environment secure. And I don't have to do it with all that ticketing, with all that, that yeah. process, if I can find something that does that well for me. How would you advise a founder to, because you're in there, you're very passionate about what you do, very yes. passionate about solving a problem. Um, but with a founder building a business, building that product and solving the problem is only part of what you do. Then there becomes this weird part of running a business. Right. How did you find adapting to that and suddenly saying, right, actually, like, I love building this, but I'm also responsible for all these people here um, and making sure that everything's okay and they've got everything they write, the right type of milk's in the fridge. How did you mm -hmm. adapt to that? To be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning on that path. And there are some tasks in, in, in a founder's role, which is everything, that, yeah. that you might not love. You know, I might not love doing the, the finance every yeah. or, or tracking finances month over month no i might not love parts of the hr or procurement or whatever it is but as i said before if you have that northern light in front of you if you know what you're driving for uh, you can actually find you know use that passion to find the interesting parts of, of every arduous or, or, or uh, uh, kind of rote skills yeah. that are need, needed to do that so I find myself, you know, finding passion in, in recruiting and in doing marketing and UI and, and administrative work and taking care, you know, for me, you know, having employees is, is oh, it's, it's exciting. It's scary. The, the level of responsibility, you know, it, it won't let you sleep if, if you, yes. you know, if you've let it kind of overwhelm you. But on the other hand, it's, it's also part of what we're building. It's uh, I, I have a, a, an attitude that says every new employee that I add to the company is also an addition and an, and, and an impact on who we are as a company, on the culture. So, you know, I see myself as, you know, in, in that interview loop where everyone is kind of looking at a new candidate, I detach myself from the technology, from, from the skills area, and I'm, I'm looking at the person because I was like, you're going to be part of, of what this company's culture is. And, and grooming and maintaining that is number one for me, which also makes the, the more technical elements easier because it's easier for me to care about the employees. I want to make sure that they have the best, you know, healthcare, the best 401k, the best, the best that I can offer them. And even as a startup, you know, I'm, I'm matching the terms of, of major companies a lot of times. And because I care about that that culture, and I want to make sure that my employees are there. So again, that passion I think is 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 a tool that you can utilize to kind of help you get through the less exciting parts of <laughs> of the founder's life. Sure. Um, we've got to the uh, to the part in the show where you get to ask uh, me the question you've always wanted to ask a recruiter. Um, and then before we we wrap up um, the the show, I I definitely want to dive into your day planning because. I know you managed to keep yourself in a uh, super fit condition. You are building a business faster than most other um, businesses and you're advising um, businesses at the same time. So I'd love just to get uh, a small insight into how you manage and, and set your day out on those. Um, but um, before we do that, this is your chance. Uh, your one opportunity to ask me anything you want and I will do my best to uh, uh, to give you the answer. All right, uh, I, I will, and I kind of kind of alluded to it before uh, when we're talking about uh, finding the right candidate. Um, again, I, I find it super difficult because I know myself, I know the, the, the people that I know and I was able to find my salesperson fairly quickly because I've, I've been grooming them. I've been grooming like a group of salespeople that I like working with for years. So it was kind of a pick of the best for me. But from your perspective, like how do you, or, or what skills do you, have you developed over the years 
to be able to do that matchmaking. I mean, to me, that would be so difficult to be able to, you know, in, in a very timely fashion, get a new customer onboarded, a customer being a founder, understand what the company does, what's the, what's the, what's the personality type of that founder, of the company, what's the culture, and then match not only the, the technological or kind of business area where you need that salesperson to be at and to be well-versed and to have the role decks for, but also to have the personality traits that would match or complement or sometimes kind of conflict to, to, a, to a good degree yeah. with that founder. So, we're, you know, how did you get to that point? Is it mostly through through practicing uh, as a salesperson yourself and experiencing that? Is it through more soft skills and kind of understanding, oh, my role is not just a kind of a tech matchmaker between skill A and skill B, but also between personalities. I'm, I'm really curious about that. So, um, so it's a great question. Um, and probably the first thing to, to say that if you want to be successful at hiring, um, particularly within sales, you have to hire personality first and 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 skills uh, second. It's very easy to match skills um, and tech. It's very easy to test that, but that's why there's a high churn rate um, because it's easier to go down that way. And then there's many reasons to why things don't work out. Um, and when you look at it, you, when you want to hire successfully, you need to hire the person that stands the best chance of being successful. And when you look at what that is, that comes down to a couple of key traits and a characteristic, not a skill set. And the reason why I say that is there are many people that have a skill from company A, go to company B that apparently do the same thing and completely flunk. Doesn't make them a bad person or a bad salesperson. It just didn't work there. And it's understanding right. those reasons. So, so, so how do we do it? It's actually really straightforward when I tell you um how, how it works but it just takes time and efforts from both parties and what it becomes is like you you'll know when people say to me um I don't, I don't like the phrase a player um but it's like what what is an a player because it's like what is an a player um mm -hmm. what what does a high performing good salesperson have in common and i'll say well if we're looking at process the one thing they are very good at is the discovery call um, and that's the same thing with with us so when we're talking to a to a new founder, it's really understanding exactly who they are, what they're like, what they've done, and also who are you selling to? What type of person will you be selling to? What do they like? How do they behave? And that starts to form a, uh, a persona. So we look at the person and then the professional. Once you lay down the, the, the person, you can then start layering in the professional bits that, that need to go around that and the experience of, of, of where you're at. Um, but it takes by building in those particular types of questions of where it is. And I'll say, look, there are certain characteristics and, and each organization will have certain different characteristics. But if you're looking at sales, I'll always say there's a couple of characteristics that will be in probably no matter what. Intelligence is one um, and work ethic, particularly in a um, in a startup. Um, and then there's other elements that go through around coachability um, that you need. Um, but then it's about understanding each business and the people that are in there and who they're going to be um, selling to that then builds you up the picture of uh, who you want to be, who you need to be. We can even go as far as then whether you need, we, we look at the, um, the in color wheel where you've got the red, yellow, uh, green and orange um, and say, right, would a, a, a red who's that fiery win at all cost? Is that going to really clash? Is that what you need at the moment? Or do you need the Butlin's uh, red coat, which is more the yellow or the green who's going to think about other people before themselves, okay? And when you're looking at um, where the founder is and, and we try and put the founder on the spectrum and you'll match it to where it is, you're starting to get a personality type that stands the best chance of being successful in the role. Um, and, you know, we see it time and time again. If you get, the character right what they were doing before um doesn't really matter um because we we kind of analyzed it and they've got um the ability to be able to uh, to make that happen that doesn't mean that you can't look for someone who's got a track record of success i would always say that you need to do that but they don't have to necessarily say for instance if you're in cybersecurity, i don't believe they have to have cybersecurity experience 
um, to be able to right. do it because that comes from the intelligence part. You should be able to pick it up um, and understand it um, and, and be able to um, uh, move forward with the business um, through that way. So it comes from a really detailed uh, qualification, understanding what the company is, what the company is all about, where the company is going, who the people are around them, and then above all, then who are they selling to? Um, what are those people like? How do they how do they behave? Um, and then we can start to bring that person together. It's not easy. It's not easy to get right. The hardest part, though, is once you've gone through that stage, it's having an interview process that identifies those key habits that you're that you're looking for and those characteristics um, and sticking to it. Because the biggest thing is around hiring salespeople is that they can talk to you. And, and, and particularly when you're hiring in the US, they're show and tell from day one at school, right? I really like this person. I can work with this person. You're like, yeah, but do they fit what you looked at? I don't know, but I really like them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but we're not hiring a mate. I know you you are going to like them because um, they know how to bring you on side. Um, right. So it's making sure that you've got that real scientific mathematical approach in the interview process to mm -hmm. get where it goes. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. I, I love I love how you wrapped it up with basically you know, identifying the, the personality traits and translating them into that, that mathematical formula of, is this a good match for founder X? Uh, so yes, absolutely. Um, it, I have to admit, phenomenally hard work, but uh, yeah, I, I love the fact that you guys are doing it. So the other, that's the fantastic. Other, the other key bit um, to be able to get to that right detail is we always ask what good looks like and what bad looks like. So what are you wanting this person to um, to do and achieve? And sometimes it'll be particularly, you know, in a, in a, um, in a certain type of world, it'll be like, I need them to get me to win you logos and get revenue. And it's like, well, you're in a startup world. That's going to be a byproduct. There's, there's something else. There's, there's, there's something in between that gets you because you're, you're asking for a, for a result. What, mm -hmm. what, does it look like? what do they need to do um, that good looks like? And then what does failure look like? Um, because right. the reason why I always get people to look at failures because you've got to, the, there is too often where the wrong hire, I don't like saying bad hires, I always say the wrong hire. Mm -hmm. Right. It's given too long. Like, um, and when you speak to salespeople, if you, if you if you had a sales leaders conference and you spoke to them all and said, have you got a story about when you knew it was wrong, but you kept going just in case against cutting it quick? They'll go, I've got a lot about where I kept it going. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> So if you know what failure looks like, as soon as you're on that path, go, uh, get rid. Right. Um, and you've got to be brave enough to do that because you'll have so many burnt leads, so many lost time. Be like, people always go about the the loss of um, uh, paying someone over that period of time. Mm -hmm. That's the cheapest part of a right. time. Okay. It's everything else. And, and the biggest part is time uh, in a startup. You lose time that you can't get back. So 100%. It's, it's critical um no i 100 percent agree yeah yeah being able to to make that that very kind of scientifically oriented cut that says yeah. no you know my mind might be saying something or my heart might be saying something else i like the person but this doesn't work we need to cut this right now you have to be you know that heartless <laughs> persona so to speak and yeah you have to you have to be able to do that I, I'm not, I, agree. yeah and i sometimes say look, that is sometimes the um the diff the difference between great leaders they're able to have those difficult conversations even if they like the person um mm -hmm. and, and but what you have to do is clearly know what they should be achieving and what failure looks like and if they're on the right. path of failure and you can't get them back from it you take emotion out and you and you make the right decision um right I know you're probably about to uh, to jump off because I've taken up so much of your time. But before I let you go, if you could just kind of set, um, because I think it's really important. I'm a massive believer in a day plan, a week plan of what needs to achieve. And, oh, yeah. and your life is stacked. Um, you know, <laughs> um, there's there's so much interesting stuff going on uh, with trying to to build a business. How do you how do you fit everything into um, into your day? How do you keep on top of everything? Um, so thanks for the compliment, but but I am a creature of habits and and being able to run a very tight schedule, a very you know, strict schedule of when do I wake up, uh, what do I do 
you know, first thing in the morning, jump out of bed, you know, there's no snooze button. Those things drive me nuts. Like I typically wake up a few seconds or minutes before my alarm clock goes off. I stare at it and it goes off. I click it and jump out of bed and get something to, to frame your, your the parts of your day. So in the morning, I don't deal with anything work related at all. It's about me. It's about, you know, waking up, going to the gym, taking yeah. a shower, cleaning up, you know, just feeling human, yeah. <laughs> you know, setting yeah. myself up for success for the day, breakfast, coffee, whatever it is, and then work, crush it at work, have a very intentional day. I know exactly what I'm up to a day in, day out, a week in advance, at least every day. What's going to, what's going to happen that day? Be mentally ready. Or, you know, I'm, I'm not a natural extrovert, all right? I'm what's what they call it, an extroverted introvert. Yeah. And if, if I need the mental energy to do people, like we're doing right now, you know, yeah. I knew in advance, I've got a podcast. I need to, to be on my A game, to verbalize, to be communicative. And it's different if I have to be more analytical. Yeah. And, and, you know, building my day in a way that doesn't exhaust me. You know, if I have to do conference things all through the day and just people all day, I know I'm going to be exhausted. I know I'm going to have to need some breaks in the middle just to kind of center myself. So being able to plan that in advance and, and take charge of that schedule. And also, again, talk about framing, not just at the beginning, but also at the end. I stopped my work life at some point. I'm not yeah. going to tell you which point, but yeah. <laughs> I do have a very clear cut where I say up to this hour. And, and that allows me to have that, you know, starting point, ending point. This is all I have during the day to yeah. focus on and to accomplish and to bring my A game. If I haven't done it by then, that's it. The opportunity is gone. It's going to be the next day. So it's a forcing function for me to say, I'm starting work at X. I'm ending it at Y. And that is it. After Y, it's, it's again, it's me time again. It's family. It's, it's about myself. It's about hobbies, you know, watching, reading, whatever it is, going out. And so having that framing to be able to do, you know, they call it work-life balance. And it, it really boils down to that. And, and having, you know, a good combination of mental and physical kind of energy and, and health, wellness in your life, I think is, is really the key for that. I think so, because that helps you to be able to do what you're doing um, and have that start, which isn't start work at 5 a.m. like a lot of people like saying, yeah. you have that end point. I, and I say that people can do that, but when you're in that zone, you got to work and you got to stay focused. Force yourself. You've got yeah. to get it done because you can't allow yourself outside of that um, that barrier because then it's just like missing tight. It's like missing what you're doing. It's like, right, I've got to get it done because it's important to me um, on, on where you're in. Mm -hmm. So um, I love that. Um, no, you know, I really appreciate your time uh, uh, and coming on and sharing your thoughts. I think you've, got, you've had a, a fantastic journey. Uh, super impressed with what you guys are doing. I'm super impressed with the speed um, in which you are, you are doing it um, as well. So I uh, uh, can't wait to, uh, to watch the ride. Fantastic. Thank you so much for, for this. It's been a phenomenal conversation. I really love the questions and, and the, the report here. And, and all the best with uh, with the continued work on the, both the podcast as well as the business. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you very much.